not to do a whole bio thing, but I'm coming at this from a little bit different angle than some of the other folks that have been here today. Um, I work for ThoughtWorks Products, which is our product division, um, specifically with some of our continuous delivery and testing products. The reason I bring that up is that's given me the opportunity to see a lot of continuous delivery pipelines. Um, some of them really good and some of them not really good. <laughs> and so what I want to do here today is really quickly just go over some patterns um, that I think are important uh, for continuous delivery and continuous integration, specifically when it comes to uh, Kubernetes and Docker and, and some of the, the newfangled stuff now. Got to get those buzzwords out there. Um, so the first concept that I want to talk about really is not specific at all to Kubernetes or anything. In 2006, three thought workers presented a white paper um, at Agile 2006. Um, called the software production line. And one of the key concepts that came out of that and, and the books and stuff that followed, the idea of artifact management and continuous delivery. And what I mean by this is that whenever you're doing continuous delivery, and it doesn't matter what you're doing, you should build a thing exactly once. You're doing Java and you're building a jar file, you build the jar file, you put it in some kind of artifact repository, and it's that exact thing that you then put on your other environments and test. That way you make sure that once you get to production, you're deploying exactly the thing that's gone through all your tests. Um, not the same thing rebuilt from a tag or what have you, but exactly the same thing. Now, this is pretty easy if you're talking about a small jar file. It gets a little bit harder and you're talking about larger artifacts. And that's where like, things like Docker, wait, well, wait a minute, that's not really the same thing. In fact, you'll see in a minute, I hope, that it actually, it is. So, one of the patterns I see a lot, and this is probably, a lot of this is, is repetition, you already know some of this. But I want to cover it because it's for a very specific reason. When you get to Docker, so you have your OS, you have your Docker engine, and you have your containers. One of the things that we see quite often is people treating containers like virtual machines. And so they take a Docker container and they put on everything in there about their application. So the actual application and the database and the message queues and basically just create a, a VM and call it a container. And so it becomes a really easy thing or, you know, to deploy because it's just a single thing and it, you open up a port and it works. Um, and they're like, woo, I got containers. In fact, you really want to look more like what Paula and Alex were talking about is the smallest thing that works. What you really want in your containers is to have very specific ones doing very specific tasks. And so your applicant, application container is different from your database and you know, so forth. Um, very loosely coupled, et cetera. Talking through interfaces and such. This is where things like Docker, and especially when you're talking about CI and CD, get a little bit more complicated because of the networking and how are they going to talk to each other and how's the app server going to find the database and what's the namespace and how do I do DNS and there's all these things. Okay, enter the orchestration products. Uh, I saw a tweet this morning, um, I'm not sure the exact date, but apparently it's Kubernetes third birthday, uh, which is surprising to me that it's been out that long, but some of this stuff really isn't brand new. But you know, what Kubernetes is bringing to the, to the party and you know, folks like Nick and stuff will go into this, or did already in a little bit more detail, but is that orchestration? So it can help you, if you haven't already used it, it helps you with this kind of thing where you can say, this is my app container and this is my database container and help me with the DNS and help me with the scaling and all of that distribution. Okay, so this is what's handling a lot of that communication for you. Uh, and that makes it really attractive when we come to things like empowering teams to do their own delivery, things like continuous delivery. One of the tools that we use a lot is a tool called Helm. So Helm is a package manager um, for Kubernetes. Think of it like if you're using Linux and you're using Apt or Yum or something like that, or, or uh, Chocolatey on Windows or Homebrew on Mac, et cetera, uh, it's a package manager. So like the product I work with the most is our, is our CD product, GoCD, and there's a Helm chart there. And so I had used applications deployed on Kubernetes, but I'd never actually touched Kubernetes myself until about six months ago. Uh, and I put a thing on YouTube that in about three minutes I had GoCD running on a Kubernetes cluster because you just type helm install GoCD. So it makes it really cool. But again, everything has caveats. So just like anything off of like public Docker Hub or the heck virtual box containers or what have you, you know, take it with a grain of salt when you're using things out there on the public. You want to make sure they match your needs and do security checks and all those kinds of things. Um, but this makes, again, things like CI, CD a lot easier because now I can have my continuous delivery thing, execute a Helm install, test against it, and see what happened. Now, we talk about CI, CD and in Kubernetes and Docker, there's really two distinct use cases that people talk about quite a bit. Um, the first one is deploying and testing your actual applications. So I'm building a you know, web app or it's microservice or whatever it happens to be, um, and I want to deploy it and test it. Um, onto something like Kubernetes. 
Uh, the second is using Kubernetes to, as your CI, CD system. Um, and they really can be either or both. Okay, so th there's no reason that you can't take um, you know, CI, CD system, put it on Kubernetes, use that to auto scale and some things I'll get to here in a second, um, for an application that's not itself going to end up on Kubernetes. Uh, and same the other way around. You can take your CI, CD system, have it be deployed a different way and be deploying to Kubernetes. And so it's important you understand what you're trying to do when you talk about it in this context. Now this is where I do purposeful repetition. I said at the beginning that the pattern of artifact management came all the way from 06. This is the same slide that was there. This actually isn't a screw up with me. This is, I meant that to be there. <laughs> um, but if I click this once, notice artifact repo will change to Docker registry. And so probably the, mo the most important concept, the, the one takeaway, if you will, of my talk is going to be that you really can treat this at a high level the same way you do any other continuous delivery. Um, I think it's a real anti-pattern to say, this is our process or tool or what have you to deploy um, on Kubernetes, and this is our process or tool for mobile, and this is our process or tool for what have you. You really want the same general ideas. So what this allows us to do with the Docker registry, again, for anyone that's not familiar with Docker, one of the biggest advantages to it, other some of the other container mechanisms out there, is the file system that allows me to transfer only that which has changed. So if I have a, a container and I make some small change and then I need to deploy that, I only have to transfer those bits. I don't have to transfer the whole thing. So if you look at like CD products that have native integrations with Docker registries, that allows us to do this where we're storing the artifact, but we're not actually transferring the artifact over the wire every time. Uh, so we can still get good performance. So then what that means is that if I'm running my CD system itself on Kubernetes, I can get really good cost controls and things like that. And Kubernetes, again, this is one example. There's you know, Swarm and OpenStack and other ways to do this. But the idea is that you can run your, your, your CI CD server in an elastic way. So you have your scheduling engine running, and when you need to build something, it spins up a container or a pod, what have you, does the work, gives you the artifact, or puts the artifact in the registry, and then goes away. And so it's a really good way to control costs and so forth. Now, you actually have to be aware of something, though. Remember I said only the difference in the file system changes. If you're doing brand new build agents every time, you're not taking advantage of the caching services, um, then you don't have the original image, right? So you're transferring the whole thing. So this is one of those caveats, one of those things where you need to be aware of, is that uh, if you are doing an elastic build infrastructure and you're building Docker containers, um, the actual, each stage or each process might take a little bit longer because it's transferring the entire container, not just the difference. So then what this looks like here is, you know, it's a continuous delivery pipeline. And so the, the job of a continuous delivery pipeline, to be clear, is to kill a release candidate. Okay, you cannot prove software is good. You can absolutely prove it's bad. So the job of a CD pipeline is to take code that you committed or a change that you made to the infrastructure or a security test or whatever, run it through the entire pipeline and prove it's not good enough. Kubernetes has some nice things that allow us to do this, uh, much like some of the other talks we're talking about, to make sure that we're really confident, um, like things like namespaces. So I can push the image to a Docker registry, do a kube control or kube cuddle or kubectal or whatever you want to call it, uh, apply. That takes only the differences, puts it on staging. It's still the same cluster, it's just a namespace difference. So this enabled us to do things like canary releases where I'm deploying only to a certain percentage of my clients, et cetera. Caveats here. So Jerome is actually the person, he used to work for Docker, doesn't anymore. Um, he worked for the company before it was called Docker. He's the one that wrote the, the code that became the privilege tag that allows us to do what's called Docker and Docker, where I can actually build Docker container inside a Docker container. And he wants everybody to be aware that it's not 100%, what, what, how do you put it, sparkles, ponies, and unicorns? Um, there are some issues you need to be aware of. They're mostly well handled but you need to look for them. Things like file systems, um, the, the, the underlying container is running in privileged mode, so maybe there's a security implication there, um, et cetera. There's all kinds of documentation out there. Um, I don't have it on there, but it'll be in the distributed one, the link to his original blog article. Um, there's some on the gocd.org on our, on our uh, documentation, et cetera. But there are things to be aware of, just so you know. So really the summary is that you know, CI and CD are well supported on Docker and Kubernetes. These are new to a lot of our organizations, but they're not brand new technologies. Um, and so they are well supported, but there are things you need to be aware of. So watch your file systems, think about if you want to use Elastic Agents, um, think about the security implications of Docker and Docker, et cetera. Make up things to you. And again, my key takeaway here is that the actual process 
should be similar to your other deployments. It's not exactly the same testings. It's certainly not the same deployment mechanisms and so forth. But this is not a whole new thing to do continuous delivery when things like Kubernetes and Docker are involved. Um, your, your tooling, your processes should support whatever you want to do. Two seconds over. Thank you very much. Thank you.